1968. On the move. Americans were on the move in 1968, moving from the cities to the suburbs on newly built highways, traveling in impressively designed and safer new cars, flying from one region of the country to another and from one country to another in new wide-bodied airliners. And they were rocketing into the last great frontier, space. For the next hour, we're going to take a look at all these developments in transportation during that landmark year, 1968, starting with America's favorite mode of transportation, the automobile. The United States is the third largest country in the world, with its 50 states spanning over 3.5 million square miles. It's a country which has always relied on diverse forms of transportation. During the first half of the 20th century, the railway dominated as an effective, affordable way to travel throughout the country. But by the 1960s, the auto and the airplane were challenging trains as the dominant methods of transporting Americans. Bright new beginning to a beautiful 1968. Chevrolet's Impala Sport Coupe. And by 1968, the automobile was reaching its peak in popularity with the American public. During a time of relative prosperity, when disposable income in the U.S. rose almost $50 billion, Americans bought over 9.1 million cars, a 6% spike from the previous year, and just below the all-time sales record of 9.2 million in 1966. These were distinctive looking vehicles with long hoods, short trunks, and plush interiors. Over 8 million of those cars sold were manufactured domestically, primarily produced by the big three automakers in Detroit, Ford, GM, and Chrysler. Coming through loud and clear is your new Rambler 440 sedan the best-dressed four-door in its class. Along with the fourth Detroit automaker, AMC. And we were driving those cars everywhere. It was pre-Arab oil embargo, so if you were able to put two bucks worth of gas in your car on a Friday or Saturday night, you were good for both Friday and Saturday night. Overall, the American consumer had hundreds of domestic cars to choose from. There were about 266 different models available, ranging from $1,800 to about $3,000. But the popular cars were the Chevrolet Corvair, the Nova, the Ford Mustang, and the Falcon, and the Fairlane. You've got all kinds of AMC products. There was so much more available at that time because there were so many different brands. 1968 is happening. Something young is happening. The young mobiles from Oldsmobile. Auto manufacturers were reaching out to the youth markets, with GM even calling its Oldsmobile brand Youngsmobile. And Detroit still specialized in making big, gas-guzzling sedans and luxury cars. We expressed our luxury by size, and America was going to say, hey, we're big. The car du jour for families was the station wagon. And there were just so many different manufacturers producing wagons because that was the hot form of transportation. It was before the SUV, before the crossover, and this is how you got your family from point A to point B. And there were a lot larger families then than there are today. While the foreign car didn't dominate the American market in 1968, it was growing in popularity. The foreign cars started coming into this marketplace, and you would think it would be, you know, typical Nissan, or at the time it was Datsun, or Honda, or Toyota, but we also had BMW, and Alfa Romeo, and Volvo, and these were all brands that started making pretty good reach into the marketplace. But one foreign automaker stood out in 1968, the Volkswagen from Germany, with its revolutionary compact model, the Beetle, first sold in the U.S. in 1950. Its popularity peaked during the 60s as it was adopted along with the VW bus as inexpensive transportation for the hippie generation. Although it was big in Europe, 
once it hit the U.S. shores, it really had an impact, not just on the culture, because it was part of the counterculture, but it was a great vehicle that got people from point A to point B, and it really stood out and made a huge statement. Cars were also becoming safer, partially due to activist Ralph Dainter. Yet it is quite obvious that over the past five decades, there's been no more serious avoidance of government responsibility for the public safety than that which has persisted to the present day in the area of automobile transportation. Who had written his landmark book about American automobiles unsafe at any speed three years earlier. Armed with case files from more than 100 lawsuits pending against the popular Chevy Corvair, Nader was able to successfully assert that American cars were generally unsafe to operate. Although those assertions were met with initial resistance from the big three automakers. Stubborn executives at the head of GM, Ford, Chrysler, they didn't want the federal government or anybody to tell them how to design a the car. They were into horsepower, style, minimized safety. Today, I will sign two bills into law. First, to protect the driver. The Traffic Safety Act will ensure safer, better protected cars in the event of an accident. President Lyndon B. Johnson responded to those safety concerns by signing the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act, which led to important new auto safety features. On January 1st, 1968, a federal law went into effect, mandating that all cars have seat belts. Automakers were also federally required to add padded dashboards, windshield wipers, defoggers, and impact-absorbing steering columns. While Detroit was responding to these federally mandated safety requirements, it was also working on advancements, some of which wouldn't become commonplace until years later, like airbags. At the Eaton, Yale, and Town Research Center near Detroit, an ingenious method for protecting people during serious accidents is being tested. When the test car smashes into this barrier, inflated pillows will burst out from the dashboard and steering column to cushion the forward motion of the dummies behind the wheel. Walter Cronkite was given a sneak peek at some other developments, which were decades away. That's a picture by a television camera mounted in the rear of the car pointing backwards, which shows the entire road behind me. And on that are two grids, uh, which give me a safety indication as to where the cars are positioned behind me for safe or unsafe passing positions. 1968 ended with another nod to the automotive future, when students at MIT and Caltech staged a transcontinental car race from California to Massachusetts. The catch was the cars were electric with 53 recharging stations set up on the 3,500-mile route. The MIT car made it first, but Caltech was declared the winner because the MIT car had to be towed multiple times during the competition. Well, do you think that a car of this sort is the answer to transportation? No, I don't think it's the answer to cross-country transportation right now, although it might be in the future. I think that this type of cars could be quite useful in the future for uh, urban transportation, however. But in 1968, we were in the middle of an automotive revolution involving high-performance vehicles. Coming up, a look back at those sporty muscle and pony cars that were all the rage in 1968. Americans had a need for speed in 1968, and that need was satisfied by a group of classic high-performance cars. Some were known as muscle cars, mid- to full-sized vehicles with potent V8 engines. Others were known as pony cars, compact vehicles with robust six- or eight-cylinder power under the hood. Detroit's Big Three, along with a host of foreign automakers, all produced versions of these flashy, high-performance vehicles. Designed with the youth market in mind, representing the relatively prosperous baby boomer generation. Some prescient people in the auto industry 
realized that there was this massive new wave of buyers that were just entering their mid-teens. They were turning 15, 16, 17 years old. They were the most affluent generation in history, so it made really good business sense to develop a product to sell to these people. These kids were car crazy. There were two sports cars that set the pace for the others in the late 60s, both introduced in 1964. The Pontiac GTO, a muscle car from General Motors, launched by a pioneering engineer, John DeLorean. And the Mustang, the original pony car, championed by Ford's maverick executive, Lee Iacocca. This is a brand new 1968 Pontiac GTO. It's been beautifully restyled from bumper to bumper. The sturdy Pontiac GTO was Motor Trend Magazine's Car of the Year in 1968. The Pontiac GTO set the formula for the muscle car. It was a big engine stuffed in a mid-sized car with the sort of sporty features that appealed to young people like bucket seats and four on the floor shifter. DeLorean made his mark in the 1960s by creating the GTO, and Pontiac produced this GTO as a performance model. And it doesn't stand for gas, tires, oil. It stands for Gran Turismo Obligato, which means he wanted to build a performance car. Even though Pontiac really wasn't in the performance division, they let John DeLorean build a successful vehicle. The Ford Mustang was one of the hottest cars in America selling over one million units in its first three years of production. You could buy a Mustang for a very affordable $2,400, and more than 300,000 people did just that in 1968. So 1968 Mustang for us was a really nice, affordable, attainable performance car. Um, it had a nice fastback design, powerful V8 engine in it, four-speed transmission. It wasn't very practical to sit in the rear seat. A full-size human would have to sit sideways with his legs across the seat because there was literally no place to put your legs. 17-year-olds, 18-year-olds, 19-year-olds aren't thinking practical. They're thinking cool. The Mustang was also targeted at young women. When they produced the Mustang, they tried to make it very female friendly. If you look at the old advertisements, you see a lot of women, you know, independent single women who got their first job, either it's secretaries or maybe they were college graduates. This was the vehicle that they wanted. The Mustang received legendary pop culture status due to its appearance in one of the most storied car chases in movie history, released in 1968. A 10-minute scene from Peter Yates' Bullet, which featured a detective played by Steve McQueen, driving a 1968 Mustang GT Fastback. As it attempted to chase down a black Dodge Charger, another sports car favorite from the year, driven by a pair of hitmen. The fact that you had this Mustang squaring off against the Dodge Charger, these were the two most charismatic muscle cars you could buy in 1968. And to see them starring in their own little mini movie inside this movie called Bullet, I mean, that audience just went crazy for it. And a lot of people bought a Mustang because they wanted to be Steve McQueen in Bullet. Even if they were driving at safe speeds, they still looked cool. The Bullet car is now so timeless Ford created a 1968 Mustang Fastback reboot. Obviously, the 68 Mustangs are pretty expensive on, uh, if you go to auctions these days. So you got to go back and recreate that emotion uh, to something that's more attainable because he drove, right? And so for us, it was very much a touchstone for our brand that is Mustang that we wanted to celebrate. The Mustang wasn't the only high-performance car making a splash in 1968. There were others introduced that year, like the Plymouth Roadrunner, an economy muscle car from Chrysler, named after the speedy Warner Brothers cartoon character. The Roadrunner was great. To me, that car embodies the tackiness, the absolute lack of class, but at the same time, the sort of masculine, and I don't mean that like toxically masculine, maybe I do, but there's a certain masculine energy to these cars. Inspired by the Mustang, AMC introduced its own pony car in 1968, the Javelin, which was built on AMC's Rambler American platform. 
And then there were some of the already existing high-performance autos, like the Chevrolet Pony Car, the Camaro, and its Corvette, a trail-blazing sports car that Chevy introduced back in 1953. These high-performance vehicles sported all the colors of the rainbow. The vibrant colors are part of the counterculture. Consumers wanted them. They wanted to make a statement in their own way. In a way, 1968 was a peak year for high-performance cars in America. Auto manufacturers were being hurt by an increase in American military forces in Vietnam. All of a sudden you had literally half a million target market bodies sucked out of the United States and plopped down in Southeast Asia. They might have been thinking about cars, they might have been wishing they had cars, but they were half a world away from the nearest car dealership where they could buy a muscle car. Overall automobile sales in the U.S. did indeed drop after 1968 dipping to 8.4 million by 1970. Those numbers would eventually rebound as young men began returning from Southeast Asia. But while high-performance cars became more sophisticated in the coming years, collectors still believe that the sports cars which came out in 1968 are truly special vehicles. Next, Americans continue to move to the suburbs as we look back at Americans on the move in 1968. The suburbs, almost as much written about as Madison Avenue, and just as much in need of reflection. In 1968, the United States was in the middle of a revolution, which had been decades in the making. The revolution involved a mass migration from urban centers to suburban and ex-urban areas, a phenomenon now known as suburban sprawl. It was directly linked to the rise of the automobile in the mid-20th century and the development of the interstate highway system in the 50s and 60s, which improved access from America's urban centers. These suburbs would become home for many of the baby boomers, the 76 million children born between the mid-1940s and the mid-60s. Every time there's a new method of transportation, I think we see a further decentralization of people because they're able to go further faster. But after World War II, the cities didn't just grow, they exploded. Because the change has been so great and so rapid, it has created enormous problems that affect the way we live. The most immediate problem was where to put all these new families. Suburban sprawl affected many of the nation's 300-plus metropolitan areas by 1968, offering those who moved out of the cities the opportunity to live in luxury that they could only have dreamed about in earlier times. As in the 1920s, the 1950s, and the 1960s, were a period of tremendous economic growth that filtered down to the middle and the working class. And because of that, a lot more people had a lot more choices than they ever had before. But suburban sprawl in 1968 was primarily a monolithic phenomenon, one which primarily involved white Americans. Over 15 million whites moved to the suburbs during the 1960s, compared to 800,000 African Americans. They left behind inner cities and were largely replaced by minority residents. The new suburbanites and their inner city counterparts were often victimized by unscrupulous real estate agents who practiced blockbusting, a procedure where white families would sell their properties at low prices, which would then be offered to minorities at much higher rates. This contributed to the decline of America's inner cities. Certainly race and ethnic divisions were a major cause of the segregating out, and the segregating out wasn't new. We had seen that from the very beginning of cities. We must find some way to dramatize what poor people face in their living conditions. Martin Luther King Jr. made the issue of fair housing a major part of his civil rights campaign in the years before his death. Fair housing for all, all human beings who live in this country is now a part of the American way of life. President Lyndon B. Johnson attempted to address these inequities in housing. 
by signing the Fair Housing Act, which became law on April 11, 1968, just one week after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. The Fair Housing Act addressed discrimination in housing based on race, religion, gender, and national origin with specific language outlawing blockbusting. But it couldn't stem the tide of urban decay. At a time when suburban Americans were seeing a boom not only in housing but in job creation. During the 1960s, New York City lost almost 10% of its jobs while its suburbs gained nearly 25%. We think it's critically important to the future of these cities and their viability that we have the tools to go forward and rebuild our cities. That number was even more dramatic in Chicago, where the city lost almost 14% of the employment opportunities, while its suburbs gained a whopping 65%. Some people think just by building housing in the suburbs, we're taking care of the problem. In my opinion, we're running away from the problem. We're not taking care of the problems in the city by going out and putting new cities and new villages. The Central Mall is flanked by a well-balanced selection of retail stores in every field and price bracket, which provides all customers with the most complete comparative shopping in the entire area. The newly established suburbs created their own unique infrastructure, changing the whole nature of commerce with multiple department stores and specialty shops under one roof in a new creation known as the Shopping Mall. The first malls opened in the late 40s, and by 1968, there were hundreds in suburbs throughout the U.S. That rebuilt landscape included new concepts in urban planning for autos and pedestrians. From cul-de-sacs, thoroughfares with only one entry point, to wider streets and sidewalks, the additional space in the suburbs was a real benefit for children, as they used the wider streets and sidewalks to ride on a new bicycle, which was introduced a few years earlier. Suburban sprawl has continued in the years since 1968, even as many large and medium-sized urban areas saw a rebirth due to gentrification. Then, as now, the suburbs offer its denizens a chance at more space and upward mobility. Well, I think that the most important thing for most people, it's allowed them to have more control over their life. Once upon a time, it was only the very wealthy and the most powerful in society that really had the ability to have privacy. I think the big suburbanization push in the 20th century particularly is letting all members of the middle class and even the working class have some of those same things. It was the year of the jumbo jet, the biggest yet, the 747 next on On The Move in 1968. The first commercial flight of the United States took place in 1914. It was a modest 23 minute trip from St. Petersburg, Florida to Tampa. But for much of the 20th century, traveling by plane was rare. The railroad was how most traveled from city to city in the U.S., and ocean liners were the primary mode of transportation to get overseas. But that was beginning to change in the 1960s, as the airlines began to dominate the travel industry. And 1968 was a bellwether year, because that year, Boeing introduced a revolutionary wide-bodied jet to the public. That airliner was called the 747. The passenger load is increasing relentlessly, 10 times faster than our population in the past 20 years. Each working day, two new jet liners are on the runways to accommodate the increase. By 1968, the commercial aviation industry was on a roll after decades of advancements. The nation's network of airports had been established. And its fleet of airliners was becoming more sophisticated. World War II had seen the development of an infrastructure for military use as we staged logistically all over the world that could then be used by commercial transports. By the end of the war had these great four-engine ocean-spanning airliners like the Constellation or the DC-6 or the Boeing Stratocruiser. So the stage was set. 
By the late 1950s, the Jet Age was launched. With the introduction of the 707, the plane used by Pan American Airlines to launch its transatlantic service to Europe. By then, air travel had eclipsed the railroads as the prime method of long distance transportation. And as airfares became more affordable, the number of passengers continued to increase, with over 152 million passengers flying commercially in 1968, which led to a new, larger airplane. Designed by America's premier aerospace manufacturer, the Boeing Company. Pan American Airlines, which was one of the leading airlines in the world, came to Boeing and asked if Boeing would create a new jet, a bigger jet, to help alleviate the crowding at the gates. And that's where the 747 started. Boeing began work on the 747 in 1966. Engineers would eventually create a jumbo jet twice the size of the 707, with four engines, a wide body, twin aisles, and the capacity to hold over 400 passengers. Boeing's engineers eventually designed a plane with a distinctive hump on its roof, which covered a raised cockpit and a second deck. The second deck was eventually utilized as an upstairs cabin, which could hold dozens of passengers. Pan Am representatives looked at that and said, well, why don't we use this area for a lounge? We put some passenger entertainment in here, a lounge area, put a bar, maybe a little piano. A lot more people got that unique experience of flying on the upper deck of the 747. On September 30th, 1968, the 747 had its grand rollout in Everett, Washington. The 747 was an instant success, with Pan Am initially ordering 25. Not long after, other airlines added the jumbo jet to their fleets. Boeing would eventually build more than 1,500 747s before it was retired in early 2018. To this day, the 747 is the most widely recognized aircraft in the world. While the jumbo jet captured the public's imagination in 1968, the airlines became a victim of their own success. As small, often inadequate airports were unable to handle the huge uptick in passengers. The most obvious shortage of all is in concrete, runways, terminals, and towers. 70% of our more than 10,000 airports are grass strips. Only 120 even use radar. In 1975, harassed controllers will be handling twice as much traffic as today. Under present conditions, they are just managing to do their job, separating aircraft safely and conducting flights. But near misses and delays are increasing. New airports were built, and old ones were retrofitted with additional runways, often at great cost to airlines and municipalities. And the largest airports became almost cities unto themselves, like the world's busiest airport in 1968, Chicago's O'Hare which welcomed 135,000 passengers daily. As the airports expanded in size, aviation officials were forced to come up with creative ways to accommodate the increased number of passengers. Like this early version of a people mover at Washington Dulles International Airport in Northern Virginia. A mobile waiting room lounge holding 100 people drives out and connects with the aircraft. Gone are long walks to finger-like building projections and the inconvenience of walking to the airplane in bad weather. The innovations of the airlines in 1968 would continue to revolutionize travel in the years to come, but they would also cast a shadow on a once thriving mode of transportation, the nation's transcontinental network of passenger railways. Air travel hampered the last great trek across the country. Next, we take a look at the demise of the railway. It was informally known as the Train of the Gods. Equipped with two 60-seat coaches, a dining car where one could order a full-course meal, and a parlor observation car taking up the rear. 
This was the Nebraska Zephyr, operated by the Chicago, Burlington, and Quincy Railroad. One of the many inner-city passenger trains which dominated the nation's transportation network. For decades, this train ran from Chicago, Illinois to Lincoln, Nebraska. But in early 1968, because of the rapidly declining demand, the Zephyr was retired, a symbol of the problems that the passenger rail industry encountered in the jet age. In the first half of the 20th century, the railroad was the most reliable way to travel long distances. During World War II, trains carried over 90% of American travelers as gas rationing and suspended auto production gave the railways a boost. Well, I think there were a couple hundred passenger railroads. It was the only way to travel in those periods. Well, they had wonderful dining car service, good accommodations. Actually, they went faster than the trains today. But by the late 1950s, cars and planes were making the railroads irrelevant. Even while the industry was spending money to modernize its trains, converting its fleet from steam to diesel engines, and adding attractive new features like dome cars, observation cars with glass roofs. Some of them, such as the Great Northern Northern Pacific, uh, never lowered their standards. They kept the train in good style as long as it ran. In an 18-year period between 1946 and 1964, railroad passenger traffic declined over 60%. And by the early 1960s, many of the major railroads merged hampered by federal regulations, which restricted the way railways could enact fare increases and make budget cuts. A great deal of the problem with the railroads had to do with the fact that they had been highly regulated monopolies. And because of that, when the railroads wanted to change their business model and they wanted to, for example, eliminate lines that weren't profitable, there was a great pushback from the public sector and I think that hastened the demise of the private railroads. The last major private rail merger in the 60s occurred on February 1st, 1968, when two of the nation's largest railroads joined forces, with the New York Central and Pennsylvania railroads becoming the Penn Central Line. Serving the densely populated Northeast Corridor, Penn Central would be the nation's sixth largest corporation. But its size didn't help because in its first year, the company ran a deficit of nearly $3 million. The two railroads were not a good mix. Different corporate cultures, which never really completely meshed. Different computer systems. I think that the officers were not open about the finances. So all of a sudden, one day, it was bankrupt. Penn Central filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy in 1970, which led to the Nixon administration's lobbying for economic stimulus for the rail industry. We will be pushing for and press on for the enactment of legislation on a permanent basis which would provide up to $750 million in guaranteed loans to financially uh, stricken railroads. We are heartened that the railroad, the Penn Central Railroad, will maintain, as we understand it, its operating schedules. That loan never happened because of overwhelming congressional opposition. Instead, Congress passed the Rail Passenger Service Act, creating a publicly subsidized service called Amtrak, which took over the passenger rail lines in the spring of 1971. We will have a single, coordinated, unified corporation running the entire railroad passenger service in this country, rather than 22 corporations. That will make a big difference because of reservation systems, because of the scheduling and so forth, which heretofore was done on a uncoordinated basis. Passengers said a final goodbye to the private lines that once dominated American travel, like Union Pacific City of Angels Line from Los Angeles to Chicago. Even for this final trip, and with all the tears shed by lovers of the railroad past, there were empty seats. More passengers, to be sure, than the train has averaged in recent years, but even so, far from a full house. In the years since 1968, the private rail companies would again see profits from freight services, especially after the federal deregulation of the industry in the early 1980s. And cities like New York, 
Chicago and Philadelphia would continue to see their intra-city commuter train services thrive. But Amtrak has never captured the public's attention in the way that its private predecessors did. Its routes outside the Northeast Corridor are consistent money losers. And its trains are, on average, much slower than the high-speed intercity railways in Europe and Asia. In the United States, the glory days of passenger rail are firmly ensconced in the past. In museums that house trains like the Nebraska Zephyr. Coming up, three astronauts broadcast from space on Christmas Eve, 1968. Their words and their mission changed history. Five, four, three, two, we have ignition. The early 1960s enchanted the world as it began an ascent into space. And by 1968, NASA's space program was delivering on its early promises. Apollo's groundbreaking missions were making history and headlines catapulting the American space program into its next chapter. We started to hit our stride by the time of Gemini 12. We had done all those things required to go to the moon. Rendezvous, docking, extravehicular activity, long duration flight to make sure that humans could last that long. Just about everything except the landing itself. Space exploration had also woven itself into the cultural fabric of the year with the release of 2001, A Space Odyssey. Stanley Kubrick and writer Arthur C. Clarke consulted some of the world's great scientists while writing the script, which would provide a preview of a near future with prototypes for computer tablets and video conferencing. Even HAL 9000, the menacing computer is a somewhat malevolent version of the virtual assistance of 50 years later. But it would be accomplishments from the 1968 space program that would continue the optimism of spaceflight from earlier in the decade and cement itself into history. The Americans were ready to see whether Kennedy's historic promise could be fulfilled. And in 1968, Two of NASA's missions set the U.S. on course to do just that. Look at the flame. 700 gallons of RP-1 and liquid oxidizer burning up there every second. First, Apollo 7, launched in the fall of that year, was the first Apollo program to carry a crew into space and the first U.S. space flight to carry astronauts since Gemini 12 in 1966. This morning, a rocket like this one, 224 feet tall, stood on that pad out there. Tonight, this much of it is circling the Earth in two parts, the S-4B second stage and the command and service module with Wally Schirra, Don Isley, and Walt Cunningham aboard. America is back in the race to the moon tonight. Apollo 7 spent the next 10 days in space, orbiting the Earth 163 times. Roger, good morning to everyone in television land. Be looking at the right-hand portion of the main display console. It was the first live TV broadcast from a manned U.S. spacecraft. And the crew successfully accomplished their primary objective an extensive orbital test around the Earth to demonstrate the effectiveness of the spacecraft's command service module with an onboard crew. The Apollo 7 was located, the crew finally brought to the Essex 50 minutes after splashdown. The astronauts there in the door. Walter Shira on the left, Don Isley there. It was a successful mission and led to a seminal event in the history of space exploration. Apollo 8 would be the first spacecraft to travel to and orbit the moon, an historic excursion which began on December 21, 1968 at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Led by astronauts Jim Lovell 
Frank Borman, and William Enders. It's a beautiful takeoff so far. This building is shaking under us. Our camera platform is shaking. Is that when the countdown goes down towards one, zero, you just have to rely on that everything that was built was correct, and you have to have your faith in the manufacturer to do that. Now, if something went wrong, we did have abort procedures. It was the first time a manned spacecraft used the powerful Saturn V rocket for its launch into space. Well, the Saturn V had only been tested two times unmanned you know, make sure the whole thing worked. And both times, the flights were not completely successful. And so one of the big objectives that the NASA management had to consider was, would it be safe to put people on the third Saturn V? Apollo 8, the first time men had ridden the huge Saturn V booster. The first time men would escape Earth's gravity. The first time men would go to the moon. Apollo 8, took almost three days to reach the moon and would eventually execute 10 lunar orbits. In a year of major accomplishments in transportation, this was arguably the year's biggest. It also became a cultural touchstone over and over. 1968, for those who of us who were alive at that time, was a very poor year for the United States. This view from Earth with a telephoto lens at uh, some 97,000 nautical miles. Bill Anders captured Earthrise, the beloved image of the Earth from the moon that would come to illustrate our image of outer space and enthrall Americans during the divisive and fraught year. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form. But the crew's transformative Christmas Eve telecast, as they read the first 10 verses from the book of Genesis, would be the most memorable moment of the flight. It was, at the time, the most watched TV program in history. And as the clock on 1968 wound down, the triumph of Apollo 8 served as a powerful reminder of our collective humanity. I remember one telegram we got back. All it said was, you made 1968, which I thought was very appropriate. The Apollo 8 astronauts returned to Earth on December 27, 1968, laying the groundwork for more exploration. There it is, a U.S. flag on the surface of the moon. We can thank them for influencing any number of space explorations that would follow from Apollo 11's landing on the moon the following year, to the landing of a roving robotic probe on Mars. NASA's little geologist Sojourner freewheeled onto the surface of Mars, a sort of robotic Neil Armstrong. They all would have been unimaginable without Apollo 8. It paved the way for all of the rest. Absolutely paved the way for all of the rest. Because there were so many important things that were done in that particular mission. There was everything except the actual landing was done during that mission. Apollo 8, this is Houston at 6804. Ultimately, the advancements in space travel, like the other advancements in transportation in 1968, made the world seem like a much smaller place and occasionally provide unique perspective of our shared planet. We close with good night, good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on this good earth. The advancements in transportation during 1968 helped make the world feel like a much smaller place. In 1968, only four million Americans traveled abroad. Almost 50 years later, in 2016, almost 67 million Americans did so. And we have to credit aviation developments, like 1968's innovative jumbo jet, as one main reason for our collective travel fever. That'll do it for us today. I'm Bill Curtis. As we leave, one last look back at transportation in 1968.